Okay. Go ahead, Steve. I will confess right off to the top. I'm going back to Green Banking next summer, and every summer I do a presentation, and I search for presentations to give this time of year. And I'm thinking, you know, binary stars could be a pretty good deal. So this is like a test bed for that to see how it works. Uh, the deal here is that if you look kind of down here towards the bottom of the screen in the big gap, you may see like four dots. Does anybody recognize what those dots are? Are those the anybody? Einstein's cross stars? Or? Nope. Nope. I guarantee you, you've all taken pictures of it. Has anybody trapezium? recognized that? That's the trapezium. The trapezium. That's the trapezium. Okay. Now, what's missing from this trapezium picture? All the rest of the nebula that's surrounded it. And, and ultimately, when you start talking about double stars and that sort of stuff, that's what we're really looking for. We're looking for the stars and not necessarily the surrounding field. Uh, the official name for this is Theta 1 Orion. Okay. And uh, what I like to do tonight is talk about double stars and about like, what are they? In some cases, some of the, 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 the scientific theory about why they farm and that sort of stuff. Uh, how to find out what double stars are out there to look at that might be worth your while. Uh, I'm a chemistry guy, and in chemistry, characterize is a word that you use to say, hey, describe them, find out stuff about them. When you characterize a protein, there are certain kind of tests to run to say things about them. Well, I want to characterize the double stars. And then once you do that, you might be interested in publicizing your efforts, you know, putting it out there for the rest of the world to see kind of a citizen science thing. Uh, if anybody's interested, uh, the PowerPoint I'm going to do is hidden here under tinyurl.com slash double dash stars. And I put that dash in there because there's also another one out there that's double star without the dash. And I didn't do that. One. This is the one that I did. Okay. Um, I guess the first thing I would ask is, well, are double stars important or are they just kind of fun stuff out there? And uh, ultimately, these binary stars, these double stars, they're the best way for astronomers to figure out the mass of a mass of stars. Uh, to just look at a single star, it's very difficult. But if you've got a double star system, uh, there's math that you can work through. Bill probably knows it better than, than I, since I don't know it at all. But it's a case where uh, the, the pull between them gives lots of uh, force analysis kinds of things that lends to be able to find uh, the, 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 the mass of the stars themselves. Um, why do them? Well, here's a whole bunch of things I just sat down and thought about. The truth is, it is a test of your equipment. How good are your optics? If you've got good optics, you'll be able to separate the double stars better, easier. Uh, in, in some cases, you're going to want to do this visually, and so it's to test your observing skills. Um, there's a, a, a new astronomical league program that's called Stellar Neighborhood, and one of the things you're supposed to do is you're supposed to be able to separate uh, Sirius, uh, Sirius from uh, its secondary and Poisson from its secondary. And in both cases, the primary in that system is really, really bright and the secondary is like eight or nine magnitudes dimmer. And it's a real challenge to be able to say, oh, well, there's the primary, there's the secondary. Um, a truth is it's a good way to test what the seeing conditions are. Um, a, a truth, uh, when I was in Glacier National Park that summer and we were one night, we had uh, what we call the, the Logan Pass Star Party. We went up to Logan Pass, 6,500 feet, the highest place the road goes in the park, and we set up our telescopes, and we were assigned objects. And I was on the double star, uh, the double double that night. And generally, I couldn't split the double double when we were down lower with the given eyepiece. We got up to Logan Pass, and it was like 3,000 foot less, or I should say, 3,000 foot higher, 3,000 foot less elevation. So. Yeah, that's right. So anyway, you could split it with it with a with a, 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 a different eyepiece. A lot of times the double stars have interesting color. Uh, those are a lot of times the one we pick to do outreach. Uh, a lot of times you can see doubles with the moon is up. You know, a lot of times we think, oh, well, it's after the first quarter. I'm putting my stuff away for two weeks. Well, if you get in the double stars, you don't have to put it away. You can go out and do it. Uh, you can do it under brighter mortal skies. I wouldn't say a Walmart parking lot, but but definitely you could go out, you know, probably in your driveway and do it. Uh, it's an opportunity to do citizen science kinds of things, because there are places where you can turn in your results. And then the last truth is that, that there are some astronomical league observing programs. And if you're an astronomical league program, not like I am, you might be interested in looking at the double star program. Um, if you do an uh, astronomical league things, they're really three slash four 
Uh, one of them is a binocular double star program. And in that, they give you 120 of them and you get to pick 50 and you do those. Uh, you sketch them and if you want, but you don't have to. And uh, it's fun to do. Uh, you're kind of sitting there with your binocular survey in the sky. I like to think about Dan imaging. Dan is hiding inside his car watching TV. He could be outside. He could, you know, do the double, but I the double star program. Uh, there's an advanced double um, star program but with binoculars, and they give you 100. You see 50. These are tighter. They're harder to, uh, to, to separate. Uh, there's a, a telescope double star program. It's the one that's required for the master observer sequence. And that's a case where they give you 100 and you get to have to do all of the 100. So this guy will probably take a full year to do, or about a full year. Um, you do have to sketch them or you have to image them. And you do have to estimate the position angle. And by position angle, I'll tell you what that means in a little bit if you don't know what that means. And the last one's called a multiple star program. And in that case, everybody up here is generally like two stars in the system. Here you can have three or four or even more. <clears throat> and uh, it's kind of a challenge because some of those are like really, really, really tight. Uh, and truthfully, one of the things, if you do these programs, I will guarantee you're going to do a whole bunch of catalogs that you've probably never seen before. Can you see that screen that just popped up? Can you see it? Okay, because if you this list, these are different double star catalogs. And uh, truthfully, uh, you may not have heard of the Struves, or you may not have heard of Burnham, or further on down, here's Hershey, you know him. Here's another Struve. If you go through this list, it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of the big names. And uh, some of these have been around for quite some time. I'm gonna close that and go back to this. Uh, anybody use Sky Safari besides me? Go like this. Anybody? Sky Safari? I don't see anybody. I do. Okay, Joe. so if, if you're a Sky Safari user and you're interested in doing the Glee Double Star programs, if you download this PowerPoint presentation, these are hot links to uh, uh, Sky Safari Skylist that have the double, the double Star program and the binocular Double Star program and so on and so on. If uh, you don't know about Sky Safari, it's a, a, an electronic atlas, and you can load up lists to display on the screen. Here's the screen. If you see these little bitty circles here, those are the things that would be in a particular list. And so it makes your navigation, particularly if you're doing this without, uh, uh, not by imaging, but, but by visually, it makes them easier to find where in the sky. Uh, if you are not familiar with Sky Safari, it does have a couple of not quite so nice things about double stars. First is that the Sky Safari does have a preferred name that it wants to call things, which is not necessarily what you would like to have it called or the Astronomical League would do. So a truth is earlier in the day, I thought I better stick this in. And I, I said, I want to search for Struve 1234. And it pops up this HD, which is a Draper catalog number. And it wants to call it by that Draper number. And so if you try to find things, you say, well, where's my Struve? My Struve's not here, because it thinks it's a Draper. It's got this preferred thing. Um, and one thing about Sky Safari is that it has got three different versions. It's got the free version, the plus version, and the pro version. And people always want to know, well, which one should I get, the plus or the pro? If you're a double star observer, you want the pro, because it's got more of them with the right names in it. Okay. Otherwise, it's like you can't find it, and you can't add it to the database. And so you're, you do it out. Okay, anybody in the print kinds of things? I don't think a whole lot of us are print people, but if you're a book person and you wanna know about double stars, I would recommend Agnes Clark. She's got three really, really, really good books that are out there. And this is the oldest and this is the newest, I believe. And double stars and Northern light polluted skies. That sounds like right where I live, where I'm, I am right now. Uh, so what's a double star? A double star is a pair of stars that are closely spaced together. And when I say closely spaced together, if you can see my picture, my fingertips are closely spaced together. But if I do, my fingertips are closely spaced together. And in reality, this guy is like, you know, six inches apart depth wise from you. Um, a double star can be what I'm gonna call coincidental, or it can be like a real, as we go to the next thing in there, a binary star. Uh, anybody know uh, in the summer triangle, What's the famous, famous double star? Alberio, right? And so my belief is Alberio is a double. It is not a binary. I think they discovered this about a year and a half ago. 
Uh, a binary star is a pair of stars which physically orbit each other. There's a gravitational rotation kind of thing, common center of mass and that sort of stuff. And binary stars are the ones that we're probably going to be most interested in. A multiple star is a binary star, but there's more than two components. There might be three or four. That picture does, uh, of um, the trapezium, that has actually more than the four that you saw. I think it's got six or seven components in that system. Uh, most doubles are true binaries. Okay, but like I said, sometimes are just kind of eh, kind of blind up. And then when you talk about the, the stars in that system, uh, there is a star that's called a primary. It's the ma most massive. It's the one that's brighter usually, and it's always labeled A. So um, if, if in that Struve thing that I talked about Stru uh, before, Struve, uh, one, two, three, four, the brighter star would be Struve, one, two, three, four, A. And then the most mass, the second most massive star is the secondary and it's B. And I don't think there's a word for the third brightest or the fourth brightest, but they go along with the rest of the alphabet. So it would be C and D. And the, oh, they're capital letters. And the reason why I mentioned capital letters is if a lot of times you see a smaller letter, a smaller letter would be given to something that uh, would be an exoplanet. Uh, how do you tell? Well, it's generally somebody looked at them with a telescope. Okay, and uh, they measure the angles of the double stars to define how they're going to move over time they move. And if how they move describes uh, like an arc, then they would say, oh, well, that's going to be part of an elliptical orbit. And they would be able to figure out with enough observations what the equation for that orbit is going to be. And so it would be a binary star. If on the other hand, they don't move or they don't move in the right way, then it's just going to be an optical. And an optical, like I said, is a double, but it's not a binary. Okay. When you talk about binary stars, they are classified into two different groups. The visual ones are ones that we can physically see either with a naked eye, like Alcor and Nizar, or with ones you could see with a telescope. And a perfect example of, of something you could see with a telescope and split would be like the double double in, in Lyra. Uh, if you have things that are closer together uh, and you have you know thick atmosphere and seeing like the night you may not be able to separate the stars that make up that system. And so those are non-visual. And what you see with non-visual are three different categories. And I get the three different kinds of pictures. In one kind of picture, like Elgol, uh, uh, Beta Perseus, uh, that's a case where it's an eclipsing binary and one star will go in front of the other, but they're so close that we can't split them with a telescope. What you would see in this, this little blip going across the bottom is supposed to show the brightness or the magnitude of the system. When it dips, okay, that would be able to be seen from the Earth, and we call that a variable star. And these kind of guys should have two dips. And I have the pictures over here. Yeah, you see both of them right there. And so even with Elga, you can see the two dips in that particular system. A second way of being able to have one that, uh, that can be separated or, 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 or not separated, but that we can't see, but we can tell that it's going to be a double star is to have something that's called a spectrographic binary where two stars are going around a common center of mass there. And if you look at the specter, you'll see that those are two different kinds of stars. My red green color blindness says that's a red, tiny red star. And it tells me that's a big, is that a white star, whatever color that it has, they're going to have different spectra. And what will happen is if you train a spectrograph at that system, over time, the spectra will change between one and the other. You say, how can that happen? What, what makes that happen? The surface temperature is such that it, in some cases, it can drive the electrons and a hydrogen to higher energy levels. And so you would see more of a transition. And in other cases, it can't drive them high enough and you won't see that transition at all. And then the third kind of thing is I'm going to call this guy right here, the anomalies and proper motion. It's going to say something like, oh, it looks like that star is wobbling as it goes through uh, uh, space. It's, it's, it's moving. You say, well, stars don't move. Like, yeah, they do. They just move kind of slowly. And it's kind of funny. One of the stars that moves the fastest of them all is a Bernard star. And you can track the motion of Bernard star over the period, of, of course, of a year. Uh, why do they farm? Uh, well, first off, uh, how many doubles are out there? Well, we don't exactly know. And if you were to do an internet net search, there you're going to find all sorts of conflicting data. I've seen places when I put this thing together that said, oops, sorry about that. Oops, I quit. Previous, previous, 
one more previous one source said 50 another source said 85 i saw a 60 i saw a 75 i saw all sorts of different numbers i asked amy once and amy said ah, about 70 and so different people say there are different numbers of double stars uh, apparently there's some evidence that the stars are born in pairs and this is the hot link if you want to read that but the truth is we can't really tell until we really see a proto star form buying and it makes a binary system and ultimately that's very difficult to difficult to do it's very difficult to see but they think based on just pure number crunch and there might be two different ways or two different mechanisms uh, that, that cause multiple stars to form one of them is called turbulent fragmentation and the other is called disk fragmentation and part of that has to do with the size of the the spinning disk the, you know the hydrogen the helium all the trace elements that are going to be in there as they farm if it's a big enough system and, and ignore the 100 astronomical units here for a second but if this is a big enough system as it spins around there are going to be some localized turbulence that might eventually farm into you know to the to, to, to stars themselves uh that's what's true with the wide binaries and that's going to be the uh the 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 Come on, I'll get this right. It's going to be through the turbulent fragmentation. And then if they're smaller, these kind of things can be, be disrupted and you can find centers in here. And so individual stars will find and farm in the centers. Uh, stuff you need to know about binary stars, okay? The stars are gravitationally bonded together, okay? They're, they, they revolve around the common center of mass. Uh, that common center mass is going to be closer to the big guy you can see here in the picture um there's going to be an elliptical orbit and, and 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 you're not able to see the circles here you're only able to see the motion of the stars themselves the distance is going to change periodically it's going to be repeatable the official name for that is the separation and there is a, a symbol that you frequently see it is the greek small letter rho and that's why I wrote rho here and then the angle between the stars changes and that's called the position angle and that's called theta and truly these are measurable values and a lot of times people who are interested in double stars uh, will actually measure these kind of things and i'll talk about how to do that in a few minutes uh how long have people known about these guys galileo found out about them and people in his time were actually measuring the value of rho and theta though i doubt that they called them back then and the official word that I've been trying to avoid using until now is that if you can look at a double star and you can see all of the components in a double star, you are doing something that is called splitting it. And splitting is the big word. And so can you split that double star? And again, that can it, that is going to depend upon your equipment, the separation of the stars themselves, uh, the weather, uh, all sorts of different kinds of things. Um, this one I threw in because I just wanted to, okay? Everybody knows about Alpha Centauri, right? Everybody knows about Proxima Centauri, right? This is something I just found it rather recently, okay? When you start talking about it, Rigel Kent is really Alpha Centauri and it's a double star. And the two guys that make up this double star here are really, really close together. There's uh, seven, a little bit more than seven. I just clicked, don't fancy, I had to click. Um, they're like seven arc seconds apart. And the stars are bright so it's really 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 difficult to be able to separate that guy to split that guy there's a third star in that system and it's called proxima centauri and we know based on orbital calculations that all these guys go around the common center of mass which is way the heck over here and this guy's got a, a tremendously long period but this guy is so far away it's two degrees away okay and you say, well, how can that be in the same system? How can it be so far away? Well, it's because it's so close to us. You can actually see that kind of motion. I was really surprised to see that. Okay, if you wanna go visit doubles and you wanna just go see them as part of an open house and you got a telescope, these are the ones you need to kind of know. Alberia was the biggie. That's the Cub Scout star. Uh, I was in West Virginia last summer and I heard somebody call it the West Virginia star because the West Virginia University has colors of blue and gold. Uh, Mizar and Alcor, that's a biggie. Their Tapezium's a biggie. Epsilon 1 and Epsilon 2 Lyra, uh, that's called the double-double. 
in that there are uh, two double stars that are very close. If you don't use enough magnification, it looks like they're just a double star. But if you use enough magnification, the one double star splits, the other double star splits, and you're really looking at four. That's kind of cute. And an algol is another another one. An algol is actually a naked eye uh, double that you can you can see is a variable star. And over about a half an hour period, every three to four days, uh, you'll you can see it dip in magnitude versus the stars around it. Uh, if you want to know more about double stars and more double stars, the link down here to the Cloudy Nights Double Star Program. They're always talking about, about cool ones to look at. Uh, if you're into double stars, the best catalog in the world is kept by the U.S. Naval Observatory. It's called the Washington Double Star Catalog. And I would direct you to a FAQ on it. Both of these are hot links if you want to go there. And I got to tell you, it is not a user-friendly kind of place in a whole lot of different ways. Uh, if you go and you look at the catalog, their, their entries are kind of cryptic and a little bit hard to understand. Uh, so a guy in Italy whose name is, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, Sordo, and I give up right there, okay? He's got a friend in for it. And it, for the friend in, it's called Stella Doppi. And Stella Doppi is really easy to navigate, okay? And Stella Doppi, go to the homepage. Okay, what star do you want to search for? Let's for, search for A L G O L and search. And there, it'll show me about that guy. It'll give me information. Okay, and we'll, I'll show you a little bit more later. But that's easy to navigate compared to the um, Washington Double Star Catalog. So, uh, if you were to search for Sirius, the Alpha Canis Major, it shows you this kind of thing. And the first thing I think is funny is that apparently in Italian, it Sirius is not Sirius. Sirius is Ciro, whatever. And it's got an SAO number and it's got a Washington Double Star Catalog name. And the last observation in the Washington Double Star Catalog was in 2020. And it has a position angle that's 66 degrees. And the separation between the primary and the secondary is 11.3 arc seconds. And it tells you the magnitudes. If you look at the picture, this is the primary, okay? This is the series that we always know about and think about. Down here, there's a little dot of unknown color to the red, green, colorblind eyes. But that dot is the current position of Sirius, not Sirius, Sirius B, and Sirius B is affectionately called the pup, okay? And you will notice that we are about at the maximum time for the separation between these two guys. So if you ever have a desire to want to see the pup, now's the time, okay? Versus over in here, it's like, well, 2042, don't even give it a thrill. Um, I would tell you that somewhere right about, and, and you'll notice that these are big numbers, they, they've replaced the, the past dates with, with these, these ones in the future. Somewhere over in here, there are astronomical league postings where people would say, oh, you can finally see the pup. It finally came out of the, out of the glare. So whatever, that's it. So anyway, how, do, how does somebody do this? And I want to talk about measurements. And I first want to talk about visual measurements. And then I promise I'm finally going to get to the imaging stuff. So if you're going to measure double start, see, here's Grant's name. Grant, get ready to talk. Uh, if you talk about how to do it visually, you got to do that out in the field. Visually, you're sitting at your telescope and it's freezing cold in the middle of winter and it's at night and you got to do it. There are two devices that they've used in the past to do that. One's called the filler uh, micrometer and this is kind of one. And they don't make these anymore, though if you go to eBay, you can find some for, for sale and they're not cheap. And the second is something that's called an astrometric eyepiece. And um, uh, they still have, have, have astrometric eyepieces. The reason why this is an MA-12 is it's a need, need used to make those. I don't necessarily know um, uh, if they make them anymore, but you can still find them. Um, the idea on the fielder micrometer is that, that uh, I think there is a line that ran across the center of the field and you would line that up on an east-west direction. No, you would line that up on the direction that connected the multiple stars. And then there was a knob and the knob can, can control the spacing of two very fine wires. And I, I believe somebody said that one time they used uh, spider webs for it. And what you would do is you would turn the knob and you would try to put the, the, the spider web, the, the, the wire on top of each of the stars. And then you could read the separation off the dial. 
Uh, imagine you're doing that in the cold, dark night. And imagine who are the poor people who are probably doing it. And I want to say, I hate to think about how many graduate students had to spend how many hours working on stuff so they could write their papers to get their master's degrees, okay? But that's the kind of thing that they would do. The second kind of thing is called, uh, like I said, the, the eyepiece. And I'll talk about this eyepiece in just a second. But uh, I'm going to step back here for a second and, and talk about Grant's thing. Uh, one of the truths is, and I'd mentioned this before, if you were going to work on the Astronomical League's uh, double star program, you have to estimate the position angle. And with this thing uh, here, this is how you do it. And this is a hot link. If you click on a hot link, it'll take you to, come on, there, that page, which has got the thing. Oh, crazy. But I'm going to but I'm gonna to go to here, which is a little bit bigger. And the reason why I call this Grant's position angle finder is, gosh, when was it Grant? 10 years, 12 years ago or something yeah, like that? It was, it was, I was working on it. And Grant said, use this. And I said, okay. And he gave it to me and it was cool and it works. Yeah. Okay. And so I would like to call it Grant's thing and in, 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 in thanks for, for him to point the thing out. Uh, it's really good to, to, to use it for estimation. You print yeah. this thing out on a stiff piece of paper. You cut out the center hole for an inch and a quarter eyepiece. And if you look carefully, is what they're saying? No, they're different. They're reversed. See, north and south are the same, but east and west are different. So you pick the one that matches your scope. Are you going to use a Schmidt? Are you going to use a Newtonian? You know, are you going to use a, I don't know what else you would use, but, 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 but that you get the idea. You pick the right one. And then to use it, what you end up doing is that you slip it over and then you turn off the drive. <laughs> turn off the drive. What will happen is the star will trail across the field. It'll trail in the direction of west. And so you take the piece of paper that this is on and you physically rotate the, the thing around your eyepiece until the direction the star is trailing matches the W here. Okay. And then, okay, it's now calibrated. You know how that works. And then you then turn the drive back on. Now you're tracking. And you say, well, let's see, here's one star and here's the other star. And it's like, okay, that looks like it's at an angle of, pick some number, 90 degrees. And you would report 90. And that would work for you for uh, uh, the Astronomical League Observing Program. So, so that's a really cool thing that, that Grant has and passes out, particularly if you're interested in some rudimentary, just getting started in double stars. It, it, it really, really worked well. And truthfully, I still got mine that I laminated, I think 12 years ago or something like that. Uh, this is the astrometric eyepiece. You're looking at it. It's the reticle from it. And uh, truthfully, the parts of the reticle you use are this crosshatch line that runs down the center and then the um, circle around the outside with the numbers that are written. Uh, ultimately, what you do is you eventually put a star in the middle of here and to measure the angle, you measure the angle out. Uh, to measure the separation of stars, you would get and put the both stars here uh, on the scale, and then you would try to measure how many lines were between them. So what you end up doing is you calibrate it, and to do that, you uh, turn the thing around in a circle until it, it just works, such that the drift west takes the primary straight down the line, okay? And then you get a stopwatch, and you see how long it takes to go some distance. See, you, you know, have it coming in from this side. When it hits zero, you start to stopwatch. Go over here to 20. When it hits 20, you stop the stopwatch and say, how long did that go? Okay, from that, you convert it to the arc seconds per line. And there's a little formula down here you, you would use. Now, truthfully, this is what you, the formula that you really, really use if you want to measure the field of view of your eyepiece. But it is the same formula. Uh, this magic number, 0. 0.2507, is a conversion factor from 360 day, uh, yeah, 360 degrees per day to however many minutes it is in a second. There you go. And then you put the time in seconds here. This is the cosine of the declination. It makes a difference where the star is in the sky. Uh, if it's higher, it's not exactly as, it moves a little faster. If it's low, it, no, that's wrong. If it's higher, it moves a little slower. If it's lower, it moves a little faster. So that's why you have to do that. And then I put the divided 60 there to get it into to, uh, the field of view in arc seconds. Uh, that will tell you how many arc seconds the whole thing has moved, okay? If you divide it by the number of lines, that'll tell you what it is per line. And from there, you really can figure out 
you know, what, what your conversion factor is. You move it to another double star, you align it, you do it all over again, and you can measure it and you can report it. And like I said, for years and years and years, this is the way graduate students would also do. And, and both ways are, are uh, they're maddening because you're out in the field and it's dark and it's late and you're tired and uh, there are better ways. Can anybody want to guess the better ways? You guessed it, we're imagers. So let's talk about how you can do this with imaging, okay? Uh, hey, Steve, uh, yes, sir. Steve uh, quick, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, uh, no I, have, a, I have a Philar micrometer uh, from many, many years ago that I used in an optics lab. And uh, I, I agree with what you said. The best ones were made of spider silk because they, it had the best, you could you know, they get the most amount of tension without them snapping. You can make a very, very narrow line. And they have a very precise micrometer, extremely, extremely accurate. The problem I always had is every time you touch it to make an adjustment, the whole scope shakes so much, <laughs> the accuracy is yes. kind of lost. <laughs> well, you know, and the other good thing about spider webs is it, it's they're thin enough and they're 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 not super opaque like a wire, so you can kind of they're semi-translucent. Maybe would be a way to describe that too. You can sometimes see a little bit of the star easier to see when it's split. So, can I add one? Go right ahead. So yeah, I forgot all about that eyepiece thing. Um, there's a, there's kind of a, there's a, so if you're doing a sketching mode, you're right, Steve. So the ultimate way is to do uh, astrophotography is to photograph the thing, as long as you get your, make sure your direction's right. But I found that when I was doing a sketching, um, I used that, uh, I used that angle finder and I noted it. But I also looked at the sketch, and when I got home, I started thinking, well, how far off am I visually from? So I look at, you know, I look at the separation of time, and the angle was pretty close, within a couple of degrees. And then I took my sketches, and I used a protractor to measure that. And I found out that my eyeball positioning of the secondary star was close enough to the measured angle finder, which was really close enough to the PA, that I just kind of stopped using the position angle finder thing and just relied on my uh, sketches. But at the time, I remember at the time when I was doing all this, I thought, man, it would be so much easier to do the to photograph this and then get the data. And now here we are, because I keep wondering about photographing um, uh, double stars, because like you say, the color, I've been wanting to get back to do that. The, I tried to do the astrophotography of a double star when I first started putting a camera on my scope. This is before the Mars thing. But I never, I, I didn't get too many good results. And after I got done with Mars, I thought, man, I should go back and look at double stars and redo that with, with the software that we got. So having said that, thank you very much for bringing me up to uh, present day. Look at, look at the multiple star program. You might enjoy that. Yeah. I'm going to go click on a couple here and get back over to where we are. Okay, so I'm going to, can I move to the dining room? Okay, I'm moving to the dining room, guys. Oh, yes, the grandchild was asleep and I'm talking too loud. Well, no, he's not asleep. He's going to sleep. <laughs> Do you like all those slides? Previous. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about four ways that you could do this, okay? And they all are involved in imaging. I will start with what I'm going to call the screen protractor, which kind of follows up to what Grant said about using a protractor. And truthfully, uh, this is something I did 10 years ago or something like that. Um, I'm going to back up to these guys, and, and I'll hit those in just a second. So 10 years ago, I used the old C14 and I used a um, board camera. I guess that's the easiest way to describe it. I got a kind of a picture of the camera that I used here. Uh, it was an analog camera, 640 by 480. And they put a nose piece on it. I'd slide it into the C14. And uh, what I would do is I had my computer out there and I would take 10 seconds worth of video. And uh, from that 10 seconds of video, I would extract literally the position and angle and the separation. Uh, ultimately, what I would have to do is I had to try to align the, the board camera east-west so I would get drift across the field, and I could do a pretty good job. It wasn't perfect, so I would let at the beginning of every evening, I would let it go for 10 seconds, and I would let it 
the star drift with 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 no tracking, then that would give me a good measure of of um, what west was going to be. And then I would go then start looking for other kinds of stars to measure. Uh, it turns out I found out on uh, a sky and a, uh, sky and telescope site they had some um, they call standard double stars. And so they would say, oh, for this double star right now, it hasn't changed in, in age. And so the position angle is, and they give you some number, and the, and the, the separation, they give you some kind of number. And I would use those to calibrate it. And then I would take a picture of a double star. And here's an example. You can see the stars right here. Uh, there's the primary and the standard. Up here would be the, 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 the secondary. Uh, I found a program that was called, I think it was called MB Ruler. And I would take it, I would drop it on top of this, the primary. And then with the mouse, I would kind of move it around and, and up in the, the, uh, the little picture right there. It would tell me, oh, look, here's the, here's the distance between them. Here's the angle. And I converted it to, to arc minutes and it, and it worked really, really, really well. It, 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 when I compared the results that were the published data for the astronomical East program, it said, oh yeah, I was, I mean, I was always within, I'll say a half a percent of the accepted kinds of values. And again, this is before Stelladapi, and so you really couldn't look it up there. A second way of doing this is with uh, multiple images in the plate cell. And I'm going to show you how to do that in a couple moments here. And I'm going to use a program called Astro Image J. Uh, if you really want to get into it and get serious, you can look at the program called Reduc, R E D U C. And that's a hot link that will take it to you. With it, you record video, you throw the video at the program, and literally it will look at every frame, it will figure out what's going on, it will report the values for you. And the new way of doing things is called spectrum interferometry. I would think Bill might want to try that. That just seems to be right up Bill's kind of alley. Uh, one truth is that, that if you are doing individual frames and taking individual shots, uh, seeing can be a problem. Tracking can be a problem. So you probably want to make multiple pictures, multiple readings, and you apply some kind of statistics. I don't know, average 10, take the results. You know, uh, you don't want to, you don't want to kid yourself and take 50. That's going to take all night. And so that's why a program like Rebuke might help. Okay. Uh, now, how do you find out more about those methods? And I'm going to read this out because I'm going to, I think it's cool. It's like there's a journal out there, and it's called the Journal of Double Star Observing, the JDSO. And it's a free journal. It's online, okay? And the truth is uh, people like us can write articles, and we can submit that information to the JDSO. An example of one of the articles is this guy. And ultimately, if you would pull that up, you will see this is the latest July set of issues and here are a whole bunch of articles. And one of them was called Astrometric Measurements of WDS, Washington Double Star Catalog, and it lists the name. Okay, they're gonna, they accepted this work from somebody in the public. And it turns out high school students, college students, and probably serious amateurs will submit information to them. Well, if you click on that guy and open the article, here's an example of the article. And if you look and see who put this in, this was done by high school students. Okay, in an online class, and it says in there where it's from, from the Stanford Online High School, Redwood City, California, and it's just cool. I just think this is a wonderful, wonderful deal. Um, when you talk about the, oh, excuse me, let me back up a couple again. Previous, 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 and see where I said Journal of Double Star Catalog? If you click on that, that's a hot link and it takes you to the Double Star Observing Journal. And you can go to under the current issue and look at it. You can look at the archives and you can see all the past archives and you can pull them up and you can see, okay, in this archive, here are the different articles and all, all that sort of stuff. Now, where I'm supposed to be. The people who uh, run the Washington Double Star Catalog, they read the journal Double Stars. And they say they will add any data that they find in there into their Washington Double Star catalog, okay? I tried to contact the Washington Double Star people and find out what other journals they, they use, but they never got back to me. So I'm gonna say, if you wanna be citizen science kind of thing, the JDSO is the way to go. It's a place where you're gonna to wanna to submit your data. Okay. 
Now, let's pretend you say, hey, this is pretty cool. I want to do this kind of stuff. I want to be able to look at some double stars. I guess the first statement is, how do you find double stars to look at? So I'll offer you a couple of different ways. One way is to uh, go and look at the astronomical lead subverting programs, you know, you go through those and just examine the ones. And truthfully, you could probably write a paper and say, um, uh, Astronomical League has a binocular double star observing program, and I just chose to uh, measure the position angles and uh, uh, separations for the 50 ones in the program, and I'm submitting this and blah, blah, blah. And you could write up a scientific paper like that, okay? And so that would be one source. Or you could go to Celadopi, okay? And one of the things that the Washington Double Star Catalog has is something that's called neglected ones. And so I want to go to Celadopi here, and I want to show you how to get down here to the ne neglected ones. So here's Celadopi. And go to the home page. Oh, and I should explain. It says, hello, D burner 2 That's me, because I've registered. Okay. And there's a tab here that says database. And if I click database, I can scroll down here, and it will say neglected stars. And if I click the right list, it says, look, here are 1,202 neglected stars. Why are they neglected? Well, this first guy was last observed in 1982. And here's a guy, 1926. And so this is an example of a double star that you could go try to see, try to measure. You could write it up as part of the paper, submit it to the JDSO, and eventually that number would be instead of 1962, it might be 2022. Okay. So I think that's kind of cool. Presentation time. Uh, when you image double stars, there are some things that you probably should try to do, okay? You probably should try to use the smallest field of view you can with your equipment. Uh, I think I should be honest and say, I think the C14 will do a better job than an ATX70, you know? The, uh, the, 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 the C14's got a focal length of 3,900 millimeters and ATX70's got a focal length of 350 millimeters, your field in uh, a C14 is going to be like, in terms of arc minutes, tiny, the field of view and an ETX 70 is going to be degrees in terms of big, you know, smaller field of views are going to help you separate the tighter double stars. Uh, good seeing is going to be important. If you go out on a night when the seeing is terrible, your star is going to be bouncing all over creation and back again. Uh, if instead you go out on a night when it's steady, it's going to be in one place. It's not going to bounce around. It's going to make the measurement a whole lot more accurate with a whole lot bigger full wave half, half max. Um, a truth is it wouldn't be a bad idea if you tried the image when the, the star is close to the meridian. So the light from it doesn't have to go through as much atmosphere. Uh, you should calibrate your images. Uh, try to use short exposures. You know, when when we when we shoot DSOs, it's like, oh, a 10 minute exposure, 15 minute exposure, whatever. But when you're doing um, uh, double stars, try to do short exposures. When I did the program 10 years ago, I was doing exposures like a 500th of a second to capture it, and and ultimately it would kind of freeze pretty pretty well. Um, video was good. Okay, uh, I don't necessarily know that you need to stack your images. But you know, it 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 it, it would help. Uh, monochrome or color not going to make any bit of difference. Uh, try not to bend because that throws away some of the resolution. And truthfully, if you want to do this, the C14 is going to work pretty pretty well if you've got a camera. Yeah, and the club does have a camera. Somebody say something. Oh, I was, I was just saying. I hope the C14 would work well. Yeah, yeah. The only problem, and and I got one, I've got some gotchas a little bit later. In, in the, the only gotcha I have with the C14 is, is it's the C14. Yeah. Um, what do you do? Well, you go out and you go to the target and you take your calibration frames and then you run the exposure sequence on however many stars you want to run. And hopefully you're, you're you actually in this day and age with, 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 with automation, you could do this from the inside of your car with your heater running. Uh, you wouldn't want to overwhelm yourself and do 30 or 40 of these guys in a night, especially when you're getting started. And so it really, really shouldn't take too long. When you get back home, you're going to transfer your data to your computer, you calibrate the light frames, and you do a scrimmetry. Okay. And that essentially means you're going to take the measurements, you're going to figure out. And I'm going to show a little demonstration here with Astro Image J in just a second. 
that before I do the major question, why would I suggest Astro Image J? And so down here on the bottom, you see all the biggies. First off, the price is right, it's free, okay? Uh, ultimately, if you're gonna do it, it really helps if you can play itself. And you have the ability in Astro Image J to click on a button and it'll automatically go check with astrometry.net to do the plate solves. And you can set it up to plate solve online or you know, through Nova, or you can uh, you know, do it on your own uh, with your own data. But I, based on anything I've done with it, I find that going to astrometry.net is faster than doing anything local. Um, if you need to calibrate, it can calibrate the data. It can, can measure the position angles and the separations. And it can even measure the magnitudes if you needed to do that. Because that's one of the things that Stella Dobby does report. So this is what it looks like when you have the um, um, Astro Image J screen. And, and to do it, it, it's drag and drop. You just drag your fits onto it, okay? And you click a little button and it'll say plate solve. And the button is over here on the top row. And I realize you can't see me moving my mouse, but up here uh, on this line that says WCS, click on that button and it'll, it'll do the solve. And I'll show you that in a second, real, in real time. Uh, it has the ability to zoom in and zoom out so you can kind of fill the screen with the area that you, you want to measure and what you want to do it. Uh, you need to adjust what I'm going to call the aperture. And I'm using that word as the variable star word, which is the size of the circle. Uh, Astro Image J will find the centroid, you'll find the middle of it, and you have to make sure you have the whole star in it. And so that's why you would need to adjust the aperture to make it the circle size that fits your whole star. And at the same time, you don't want your star to be too big because if it's too big, something else might be in it and that might influence the results. You then grab the mouse and drag over and, and put it uh, uh, across on the primary. You hold on the right mouse button and you drag it out to the secondary. You let the mouse button up and it finds the centroids and you got the data and it reports that information. It's really, really cool. And ultimately, if you were to do it, and this happens to be 61 Sigma, and, and I'm, I'm going to show you that in, in real life here in just a moment. But if you look at the bottom of the screen here, it pops up that kind of information about your results. Now, the truth is, since you're using software to find the centroid, you could do it three or four times, but it's going to find the centroid the same way. And so all the numbers are going to be repeated. So if you want to do statistics things, you would have to load another image, taking it another time. Okay. If you were to do that with that, oh, and by the way, that picture of 61 Sydney was something I took and did this with. Uh, if you were to compare what Astro Image J does compared to what Stella Dapi thinks, you know, there's the examples. You can, you can see them. Uh, the only difference that you might see is where that red arrow is. Uh, Astro Image J reports it is in, in terms of arc minutes, and Stella Dapi reports it in terms of arc seconds. So I, I did the conversion there. But you notice how close the separation is to what it's what it's supposed to be. Um, Stella Dapi says 31.9. I, I measured it 31.7. Uh, the position angle is 153.7, blah, 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 154. I mean, that's as close as can, you can get. That's as close as you need to be. And the truth is, it was one frame, okay? And so if you take multiple frames, quite possibly uh, the statistics is going to actually happen. Uh, here's some gotchas, okay? Long focal lengths and high magnifications are needed to separate and measure very tight double source. Well, yeah, I believe that. So you're gonna get a really tiny field of view and you can believe that. And the truth is, even with the, with the C14 out there, the go-tos may not be good enough to get the double star in your field, let alone even centered in the field. So what happens if it doesn't? So 10 years ago, I bought myself a flip mirror and there's a picture of a flip mirror and a camera on it. And the idea of a flip mirror is it connects between your camera and the telescope and it's got two ports on it. One port is for the camera and another port is for an eyepiece. And what you then do is you put the eyepiece in the top part and you focus the eyepiece by adjusting it, by pulling it up and down. Well, I should say back up a little bit. You, you focus the camera as you would traditionally focus it and you get the camera in focus, then you focus the eyepiece by unloosening the screw and lifting it up and down until it looks in focus. And the eyepiece will give you a much larger field of view. So when the star you're looking for isn't on the camera chip, you can get an idea by looking in the eyepiece. So which way do I have to slew this thing to be able to get it in the right place? Um, I did that a lot. 
Uh, it helped a whole lot when I did it. And the truth is that ASTEM has a flip mirror in the safe. And I will digress for a moment and say, and if you're a planetary imager and you can't find Mars, use the uh, flip mirror. It makes life a whole lot easier finding whatever it's you're trying to do. Second gotcha. Problem with C14 is that it's got an awful long focal length. And if you use a camera that's kind of small, it's got a small chip, you may end up with the field of view that's too small to play itself. I don't know how small that is, okay? I know that an ASI air is supposed to be able to go down to 0.2 degrees, but I don't have a clue how far down a symmetry.net can sell. Uh, so uh, there might be a problem. You could use the focal reducer to get a bigger field of view, but that throws down some resolution. Um, you might be able to find some double stars that have really tight separations and use those as the standards. And then instead of measuring it uh, as you would, measure it and think about doing it in pixels. And then once you know the pixels for the standard for, and the pixels for the star you're measuring, you can convert the pixels to the arc minutes and, or arc seconds and that would work. Uh, Astro image will tell you about the, the, the pixels too. And I think this is the last gotcha that I have. Uh, I think Dan will smile with this one. And the idea is if you stick in a Barlow or a focal reducer, if it's a 0.5x focal reducer or if it's a 3x Barlow, don't necessarily assume that that's what you're really, really getting because it all does depend on spacing. And even if you got the right spacing, it still may not be right. I think John Duchek used to complain about uh, power mates. And he said, I got a 2x, 2.5x power mate and it's blah, 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 blah. And it's a case where what the manufacturer says isn't always true. So if it's possible, take an image, plate solve it, and the plate solve is gonna tell you what really, really is going on. Plate solving is cool. Uh, let me, a couple of comments about the Washington Double Star Catalog. Only two people work on it. I, I, I'm, in, I'm in Washington. Well, I'm between Washington and Baltimore right now. And uh, I'm always tempted to drive by and look at the building for the, for the place. But it's a case where only two people do it. And, and I, I'm thinking they're tremendously backlogged. And the web page that you would go to in the FAQ that they have says you can ask them things and they tell you how to email and certain things in the header and they can furnish a list of stars to look at and uh, to do and you can submit stuff directly to them. Back when Dan and I figured I was going to do this, I, I emailed them. I haven't heard back and it's been over a month and they just may know who I am and say duck, you know, or something like that. But it's a case where have patience if you're going for them. Uh, I don't know, maybe a letter is the way to go, but smile. And one of the things about double stars, there was a family, and the family is called the Strew family, and they were Russians who lived in Prussia and eventually immigrated to the United States a couple of generations down. And there were seven people in the Strew family over a course of about 150 years, I do believe, and they all were astronomers, you know, and ultimately a couple of them got really, really into double stars. And so one of the things I will point out to you is particularly with the binocular double star program, you see that column that says prefix and you see all those wonderful Greek letters up at the top, you will see stars listed as targets in the um, binocular double star program listed as sigma something or other something or other and you will look at that and you'll say what the does friend? that mean how can i type that in how do i find that sort of thing and it helps knowing that they're screws okay and so there are a couple of ways to do the screws the elder and younger and it's things like stf and stt and stta and those are the kind of notations that they use in the um in sky safari and it'll make things just a little bit easier Strew family is a cute family. I think they're cool. Oh, let's leave, let me show you Astro Mitch, Jay, if I can figure out how to get out of here. Oh, that one gets put away. Oh, no, thank you. Astro Mitch, Jay, is just really a piece of tape to use. Okay? I have it hiding over here on my desktop. And I am going to take 66 7, no, that's not it, 61 Sigma, which is the one that I had here. Uh, 17 and 18, and I'm just going to drop it on top of this guy, 
And it's first going to open a little bitty bar of a window, and then it's going to open a nice kind of picture. Okay, and so there it is. There, let's zoom out. And so this is what we're going to deal with, except I'm not all the way there. Mm -hmm. Can I move? Yes, I can. There. <laughs> there. First thing I, I would point out with, is down at the bottom, you can change what this picture is going to look. Oh, did I mention? I think that was the Fitz file when I opened it. You can change if it's a Fitz. Uh, down here with contrast and stuff. Well, you're supposed to be able to. It's not currently doing that on my computer. Oh, well, that's not too, too important. So let's pretend there is the picture, okay? And the first thing you would like to do is you would like to plate solve. And so to plate solve this guy, there is, can you see it right here where it says WCS? I'm going to click on that guy and maybe I'm going to get rid of the more first. Get that out of the way. There and it says plate solving using the stromatry.net. And now we're now we're plate solving. Analyzing up here it says oval selection, blah 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 blah. And in probably less than a minute. Come on, come on. There, and it's solved. And once it's solved, it tries to label the field. And it says north is up and east is off to the left. And you can, if you want, there we go, under view, change those directions by inverting the X or Y or not inverting anything and whatever. So I'm going to go with it in this particular kind of direction right here. Uh, that's all kind of jumbled up. I will tell you that this is the size of the, not the size of the field, but it, it's a scale in terms of what we're looking at in terms of the field. And if I rotate the mouse button, I can zoom in and I can move this thing all over. Now, totally interesting comment to make. You see the circles? What yeah. are the circles? Those circles are those stars. And you say, but aren't those stars supposed to be in those circles? And the answer is, yeah, sort of, but. And here's the yeah, sort of, but. The 61 the Cygni uh, turns out to be the sixth closest star system to our sun, okay? And so over the time from whatever survey that, uh, that the astrometry.net is using to now they've moved that far okay and so that's kind of a bizarreness that you run into when you do the that, that solar neighborhood program and uh, it is it is kind of a thing so anyway i want to measure what the position angle is of these two guys and i want to measure um, the degree of separation and so i'm going to zoom in pretty good and i'm going to start to say oh well maybe just maybe my my um my circle there it's just a little too big. So under edit, I can say aperture settings and I'm, it's on 14. Let's move that to 12. Yeah, it's still a little big. Yeah. Oops, wrong one. Edit, aperture settings, 10. Okay. That's good enough. I'm gonna click on this guy. I'm holding the right, uh, yeah, the right mouse button down and I'm gonna drag off in this direction and I'm just gonna get on this star. I might even wanna get in the center of the star. And you'll notice that it kind of says what the arc length is and the position angle is. I'm gonna let up the mouse button, okay? You'll notice that the cross moved to the center of the star. It then figured out what it is. And it says that the arc length is 0.52 blah, 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 minutes. And if you wanted that in arc seconds, you multiply that by 60. Uh, and then this is the position angle. And it's literally that easy to measure them. Grant, would you agree that that's easy? What, what tool that. is this? What tool again is this? this? Astro Image J. Okay. And I'm going to click that in a way. And you can do all sorts of more things with Astro Image J. You can even do photometry with it if you want to do hey, photometry. Before you, before you leave this window, can you zoom out just a touch? All right, right. Uh, zoom back in so we can see both the double star and those circles. Yeah, so you've got a set of circles, 60 Cygnus and 61 Cygnus, and then you have a pair of H De uh, uh, Henry Drapier numbers. If you look at the star image, you see the very bright ones. Yeah, okay, and I'm seeing the two just to the right of it, and I was wondering if those are the HD or is HD? All the same. HD? I think they're all the same. 
Okay. I, I I mean I can load up Sky Safari. Yeah, I can load up Sky Safari and look, but I'm pretty sure that the Draper numbers are also the same as the as the sixty one blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah. Because it it tell it tells what maybe one of three. It's using three different coordinate systems. The first coordinate system is to do the plate solve. And then when it's looking at the 61 Signy, which is the, whose catalog is that? That references, who, who is that? The, yeah. the, uh, the 61. Uh, who's got the numbers? Right. I'll, and I'll, then come, up with I'll come up with them. So yeah. and I wonder if it's it, if it says, if it's using the coordinates, the old coordinates from the 61 catalog to plot those two circles. And then it's referenced in the Henry Drapier catalog to to plot the HD circles. That is so, crazy. Well, yeah, yeah. That, that is yeah. crazy. Okay. And, and and it's one of the things when, when you know when we play south, we don't think about that. Yeah, but when we're trying to get data off of it for citizen science, like Dan likes to do, <laughs> it's nice to know that you know what date what uh, epoch data that we're but, using. But remember. If you want to do this for citizen science, you don't care when these guys were done. You don't care if it was, you know, J2000, J1950 or whatever. You want J right this very moment. Yeah, but, I mean, well, what yeah, uh, but I'm saying if you're, if you're going to use some of those other catalogs that may not have been updated, you're right, you're right. And once you run into that, once you run into that rabbit hole once, you'll know it doesn't matter after that. But yeah. It's the first time you run into a rabbit hole that you don't know you've run into one. Yeah, here you go. 61 Signy, uh, here's the HD, it ends in 92. Here's the 92. Yeah. Uh, here's the Struve number for it, uh, Tycho number for it, all sorts of numbers there. No, it was blue stuff. Wait, 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 wait. Blue stuff. What is that? What is what? That tool you just, just got rid of, it said blue stack something? Yeah, it's Sky Safari running under BlueStack. So it's an Android emulator. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. This, right. this is Sky Safari. Oh, crap. Sky Safari. <clears throat> Bad luck. I opened something I didn't need to open. Yeah. So anyway, it, it's, I mean, this is really that easy to do. Here's, here's another one, and I don't know what this one is. But it's got, it's got more parts. Astro image J, drop it on top. Uh, this is part of the double star, uh, the multiple star program. Uh, and, and I don't remember what this is. I've got it in the title. Uh, this is a Struve 373 AD and a different Struve 33 AC and something else. But it's like, and it's plates out now. So anyway, the deal, the deal being, this is to me all workable, you know, in terms of if you want to do an astronomically program, you know, it's 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 got the good stuff here. Do it and be able to do it with. Um, a second through this, if you have a curiosity about double stars and want to play around with double stars, this is. I think this is really easy to do once you get the idea. Hey, I can image these. I can get decent images here on the screen. And you know, plates out with a piece of cake from, from Astro Image Day here. And and you know, you can measure these things. It's just like uh, there. Oops. There you go. And it'll 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 pop up. There you go. And so for this guy. It's 118 degrees, and the arc length is, fine, let's see, oh, about 18 minutes, or 18, 18 arc seconds or something like that. So, okay. This is too fucking easy. <laughs> no oh. kidding. Steve, uh, hey, I have oh, a question. Crap. Sorry about that. I thought my mute was on. Steve, I have a question about those 61 signals, just for example. Um, so without measuring position angle or anything, I'm not worried about the numbers so much. It seems that if you took a, use that plate solve tool and in astro image J to take pictures over a period of weeks, maybe months, would you see the relative <laughs> position of those multiple stars change in a fun way? I'm going to say probably not, but only because things move so slowly. I'm not sure. Where am I going to look for something? Well, there might be some double stars that would, you know, would, would show some relative movement to each other versus the, versus the background. And since you have north and east defined so well, it should be pretty straightforward. To, yeah, I, I would think that maybe something rapidly revolving around a neutron star that's really, really small. But the problem is we wouldn't be able to resolve those. Yeah. Right. 
Oh. You do have a number of fast movers that you can see visually of double stars and multiple stars. So no. there's one That's star. Well, there's the fastest one that's got the fastest proper motion across the sky. That one right there. You can actually detect astrophotography. You can detect it within a year that it's actually moved across the sky a certain amount. So, oh, that's Bernard Star right there that's on the screen. Am I still sharing? Yeah, I'm still sharing. So that's Bernard Star over three months. Okay. That's oh wow. Well, that's yeah three months of proper motion that's visible. Yeah. But I guess I was wondering if some of these um, eclipsing binaries are, are in double star systems, if they're rotating around each other, I mean, the angles would have to be right relative to Earth. But, well, you uh, want a cool one, Dave? You want a cool one? Have you ever heard of Algol? Well, Perseus? Yes. yes. There's one that changes. You can see it actually changed brightness over a night. Yes. At, at sunset, you can get a brightness. And then if you're at the right, if you're right in the right circumstances, you can watch it dim down to midnight and then get back bright again by three o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I'm gonna have to do that someday. Um, that, that, that's a cool, that's a cool thing. And there's a couple of others that are like that. Some are, uh, you need a telescope to see, but. <clears throat> is that Algol? Algol. Oh, Betelgeuse is back bright again. What is it? Yeah. What is he doing? You get all the cool tools, man. No, that's the ABSO's website. Yeah. I don't consider that a tool. Really? Now I got to do one more thing. Just one mag. Yeah. But it's but it's enough to make a difference. Uh, calendar calendar dates are a whole lot nicer than two. I swear I got three or four magnitudes one night. But this shows you how or the time period. Okay, that's the first. That's the first. This is it. This is it. This is it. Midnight. This is at three in the morning, and this is at six in the morning. And so <laughs> right. you, you can see how much it changes from midnight to six to about six in the morning. It gets all the way down. It comes all the way back up. And it goes from two to magnitude three point two. That's why I'm thinking. I thought there was a it was a greater span than just the one magnitude, but yeah, well, it, yeah, it, it, is, it cool. has, is perceptibly diff, uh, easy to see though, Dave. Yeah, it sounds like it. So an astro image day does look like a a way to you know take out the worry of uh, where north is in your image too. So I'm play solve and give you that information real quick. It just sucks. It just sucks. <laughs> I did this all with pencil and paper and protractor. And now you guys got all these cool tools. Well, and, and that's kind of why I wanted to do this tonight. You know, oh, it's like, let, let, let's be honest. Who's interested in taking pretty pictures? You know, and, and, and we do. That's the kind of stuff that we do out there. You know, and, and, and I, I've told you my philosophy before, you know, people image for three different reasons. Pretty pictures is one. Jimra, scientific stuff. That's me. I'm kind of a third. I'm kind of in the middle. I'm going to like, what can I, what can I see better with this? <laughs> yeah. than I can with the telescope? You know, and, and binary stars are really over towards the Jimra scientific kind of direction. Yeah. And you got to understand what the tools are. And so that's what the tools are. <laughs> 